He kōna e pūrangi tēnei nā te reo irirangi o Aotearoa. He wasn't your classic suave, sharp, dressing con man. But in some ways he's arguably New Zealand's greatest liar. Welcome to Crimes NZ, a podcast where we revisit some of New Zealand's most notorious crimes with people who got close to the cases. Today's crime involves David Ross, the man behind New Zealand's largest Ponzi scheme. It was a scam that saw thousands of New Zealand investors lose millions of dollars. And here to tell us about it is former New Zealand Herald Wellington business editor Hamish Rutherford. Uh, We got a call in the newsroom about um, some troubles at a money manager on the terrace that the Financial Markets Authority had raided and we turned up and and the office was locked. Um, Some people who worked in the office next door said there's definitely some trouble here and um, and then over the next sort of two or three weeks it unfolded that um, an extremely low profile person who purported to be managing hundreds of millions of dollars for um, individuals and families, um, that, that, that it was all, all just a fiction. Um, now, probably a good time to talk about what a Ponzi scheme is, mm. Hamish, because we'll be referring to it uh, throughout. Can you explain it for us, please? Well, in simple terms, a Ponzi scheme is a fraud where returns are paid to existing customers by bringing new money in from new customers. They tend to have very strong returns. Um, They're also characterised by the fact that it's a fiction. And as more and more people are attracted, they eventually the fund just gets further and further behind because they need to keep attracting more and more money to cover the expectations of existing customers, some of which are leaving. And eventually it collapses on itself. It was uh, founded by a guy, a guy by the name of Charles Ponzi back in the 1920s. But actually the type of fraud has been happening since before then and, and certainly has happened many, many times since. But it's but that's that's the characterisation that people people think they're getting very good returns. It attracts new people in, but but eventually the, the, the capital that people have been putting in just sort of slowly eats itself until until it catches up on the perpetrator. <laughs> How does the con man or con woman think it's going to end? It seems like it will only ever last for a little while. Well indeed, um no one quite knows what happened in the case of Ross Asset Management, but his official story was that he made a mistake with client money and he tried to tried to make it back. So you just sort of, you make a mistake or you start with a little lie. You, you say that investors generated 5% return in a certain period when they'd lost 5% and you, and you think you can get out of it. Um, what it often ends up happening is perpetrators take riskier and riskier for, uh, bets to try and make up the losses, but eventually eventually it does collapse. And, and indeed, it, indeed, they often collapse quite quickly. So who is David Ross? So David Ross, for, for one thing, he's never really spoken publicly. We know that he grew up in Otago. He went to Waitaki Boys High School, which by coincidence is the same high school I went to. Right. He studied at Otago University and eventually moved to Wellington uh, in sometime in the 1970s. And Wellington really was the sort of the financial hub of, of New Zealand at the time. All the banks were based down here. I believe he worked at ANZ for a while. Mm-hmm. He rose to prominence at a, at a firm called Leadenhall, which were quite an aggressive manager of money in the 1980s in New Zealand. Uh, they famously uh, ran the pensions for the staff at Briley Investments. That company uh, got into quite a lot of trouble in the share market crash in 87. Uh, Ross set up on his own in 1989, and that's when he started Ross Asset Management, and he slowly built up a, a business managing money for what you might call generally wealthy individuals and families. He wasn't your classic con man. He he always had a bit of a, a speech impediment. Some of the people who knew him said he, he was a slightly shabby dresser, con, especially considering the the sort of the what you'd expect from people in the finance industry. Mm-hmm. Um, he maybe that was reassuring. Well, he, well, he somewhat wasn't too, I, wasn't too flashy. Yeah, well, and the, and he lived a lifestyle that you wouldn't say was exactly flashy, but was hardly um, you know he drove a BMW. He certainly had a a, a huge house in um, out in Lower Hutt that even back in 2012, I think was valued at about $2 million. So it's, it's not like he, he didn't live a life that you'd expect from a successful money manager, but he, didn't, he, didn't, he wasn't your classic suave, sharp, 
dressing con man. He was um, quite unassuming. He he really disliked public speaking and so on because of because of his speech apparently. But in some ways, he's arguably New Zealand's greatest liar. I mean, the whole time. He was he, the people who he's managing money for often became his friends. He was going to their birthday parties. He was having them to his birthday party, presumably all the time knowing that mm. it was all going wrong. And you th- think about the sort of, you know, the mental strength it would take to just ma- maintain that sort of life. So yeah, long. well, the lack of shame. Mm. Was this a pretty classic Ponzi scheme he was running? Yes, I mean he was he was telling people that he was buying and selling shares. And he was providing um, a monthly or quarterly reports to people and you'd get a printout and you'd say you had this amount of shares in one company and that amount of shares in another company and returns went up and down. So people tended to believe it. Um, according to certainly what I heard him say once at the parole board, it, it was a legitimate company until about 2006, although... The, the liquidators, I spoke to about it later and they said no, it was probably a fraud at least back until about 2000. That was certainly the, the the event that he pleaded guilty to in court. And, yeah, by the end he was he was providing elaborate reports to all his clients about what they apparently owned and almost none of it was true. I mean, so we, we don't know exactly who the customers were. There was something in the order of about 1,700 accounts that he had or, or 900 investors, but some of those would have been for individuals, some of them would have been for families. They were predominantly from the lower North Island. Ross was based in Wellington. Um, it seemed that there were a fair number of what you call successful lawyers and public servants and so on, quite a lot of retired farmers. They were spread across the country. There were what the liquidators have told me were, you know, quote unquote, sophisticated investors, people who are sort of professional investors that had some money placed there and, 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 and they arguably should have known better. But the, the defining characteristic was that everyone was a friend of a friend of a friend. People were almost invited to be part of this and they would think that they were having a very successful time and so they would tell their friends about it and those people would tell their friends about it. There wasn't a website. And, I mean, you imagine the guilt that after this collapse this would lead to because, you know, you lost money in it, your friend recommended you went in, you recommended to your friends who have also lost money in it. So it was a, um, yeah, a, a, a sort of a, a lesson about, you know, trusting word-of-mouth recommendations. How many investors were there? I believe it was in the order of 900, but, you know, it, it, again, the... the the number of people that are affected by that, because it could be, you know, the elderly grandparents of a of a large family, and and you know, although people don't necessarily like to talk about it, the, there would be families that were expecting to in, to inherit that money and so on. Yeah. So, so when you think about the number of people who are affected by it, it could be, I would I would believe in the in the thousands because, you know, these were predominantly older people, and. Uh, among their families, there would have been an expectation to inherit that money, and it was, and, and, and to a large part, it was also gone. The other sort of complicating and very uncomfortable part about this is that you know a, a, a chunk of people did get their money out, and in fact got the the profit out, the fictional profit that wasn't real, which was arguably inadvertently stolen from other people. And so, it, I know for a fact that it created some real divisions and ended friendships and 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 so on. One of New Zealand's biggest frauds? That's my understanding. And in terms of a, a fraud considered um, undertaken by an individual, yes, the largest. And and he was charged with, you know, $115 million in losses, but, but the the clients thought that he was managing more like $450 million. So, for example, if you, I don't know, you sold your farm and you had a million dollars and you gave it to Ross Asset Management a decade earlier, over time, if you were getting sort of between... 10 and 20% of the year, that, that, that money would more than double. And let, yes, you could say that person lost a million dollars, but they had the expectation that they that they had sometimes had millions of dollars in there. There are examples of, of parents who gave out money to their children to go into houses, uh, to, to buy houses and so on, and then discovered that they had no money and had to then borrow money back off their children. I was just looking at your notes of how long this went on for. I assumed it was for a few years uh, in the early 21st century, but it started when? Well, the company started in 1989, and Ross's 
account of it was that for the majority of time it was a legitimate business that went wrong. He tried to trade his way out of it, went to the lawyers a couple of times, thought about going to police, but just didn't. The, the, the account that went to court was that it was a, a fraud back until at least 2000. And that's sort of what characterised Often, as you sort of said before, these things can, can collapse quite quickly, but these, this, this went on for, a, for longer than, than, than most frauds of its type do. And how did it all end for him? It ended when people couldn't get their money back. There were people who were trying to contact Ross saying they wanted their money and, and they simply couldn't get hold of him. I think it was in about October 2012. Um, some investors approached the Financial Markets Authority and said we can't get hold of Ross and eventually they raided his office and found, well, I don't know precisely what, but there was in a, a, certainly not the kind of state that you would expect a a fund manager of its type to be. Um, David Ross was given compulsory treatment under the Mental Health Act, and um, but very quickly cooperated with authorities. And within about two weeks, uh, the liquidated, well, the receivers then, PwC, um, put out a report saying that it was probably all a fiction. And what were the charges? The charges brought, brought by the SFO were false accounting and theft by person in a special relationship. These were representative charges. I mean, clearly he had defrauded hundreds and hundreds of people, but it was in agreement to plead guilty. There was also um, charges brought by the Financial Markets Authority providing a financial service that he wasn't registered to provide, um, making false statements to the Financial Markets Authority. But it was uh, he agreed to plead guilty to a, to a very serious fraud. All right. And... Uh was sentenced to how long? Ten years and ten months, and uh, with a non-parole pre- period of about five years, I believe. I've got some audio, some RNZ audio from Checkpoint on November 15th, 2013, and this is Judge Dennis Barry addressing Ross at the sentencing. You stole from the people who trusted you with their life savings. You constructed an enormous web of increasingly complex deceit to maintain this illusion that you were a skilled and trusted advisor and benefactor. The cold, hard reality is that you were a liar and a thief. Yeah, strong language. And here's a spokesperson for the Ross Asset Management Investors Group, Bruce Titchfond, speaking outside court that same day. David Ross is dead meat. He's gone. Today was very important for people to be able to express themselves emotionally. Very, very important. I mean, I was nearly in tears myself. I found that very, very difficult to to listen to how hurt and devastated those people are. That's a big story here, of course, Hamish, is the impact on the victims. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you might say, you know, no no one was killed in this, but for hundreds of people who expected to have um, financial security, it was taken away. I was listening to that um, segment from Checkpoint last night. There was one couple who had raised more than half a million dollars or thought they had for a house for their severely autistic son. That's all gone. And so so for many, many people, this was this was utterly devastating for them. And And I think underlying all of it is, you know, a sense of embarrassment because every single one of them was conned. And so how do we go about appraising the sentence, working out whether it's uh, too harsh or too soft or about right? Well, I mean, I, I, I'm really not sure. I mean, he he, he was released after uh, a, about six or six and a half years. There's certainly still a, a, a huge degree of residual bitterness among some of his former investors. Is it long enough? I mean, it was six years in Rematucker prison, so it's it's not exactly a light sentence. I know a lot of white-collar criminals often get very light sentences. This was a fairly serious one, but th- this was this was an enormous crime that affected you know many, many hundreds and possibly thousands of people. There are some other rules as well that came with his sentence? Uh, and Well, several. He certainly isn't allowed to um, contact any of his uh, uh, former former investors. That for some, that's a bit galling because I think I don't I, I don't know what each individual investor wants, but I think some probably would want to hear from him, might want to stand up and shout at him. Um, I mean, I guess they got some of them got a chance to do that at the sentencing, but um, so so he. After leaving, after giving his account to the parole board, he um, he's allowed he's been able to sort of disappear off to obscurity. Mm. He did appeal a sentence. He he did on the grounds that it was manifestly excessive, although the court of appeal dismissed it. 
Okay. And, and he applied, as you say, to um, the parole board. Um, I think it was his third hearing before he was eventually mm -hmm. um, paroled. Yes, it was. I didn't um, cover that. I was at the, the second of the two parole hearings and he gave this account that it, it had been a legitimate business until about 2006. Um, the, the parole board felt he didn't show proper remorse. He was certainly fixated on the idea that investors were going to try and sue him when he got out. A few months later, he had a third hearing. According to the parole board, he did show genuine remorse and, and, and they released him. Parole to a secret location. Don't hear that phrase very often. Well, indeed. I mean, you know, there will be a, a quite a lot of very bitter former investors, and, and who he will probably not want to uh, not want to bump into. And and it doesn't appear. I mean, I'm sure there's certain people who know where he is, but it doesn't appear as though investors have found out where he is. Did investors ever get any money back? They did. Um, about twenty cents in the dollars. They, these were the investors that lost money. So. There was some money when 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 the company collapsed. There was some. There was about ten million dollars worth of investments. But as I said earlier, there was also a group of investors who got out with more than their original investment. Some of them got their money out completely. In the sort of five or six years following the collapse, there was there was a number of um, legal cases to try and claw back money from different people, and the threat of court was often enough to get people to settle. There was a very lengthy. Um, court process against a Wellington lawyer went all the way to the Supreme Court. He eventually had to give uh, back his um, the profit that he made of it. I think all up they managed to claw back about $20 million from, from people who had quote-unquote profited from the scheme and uh, that was uh, uh, shared out eventually, I think, in 2018 or 2019, but about 20 cents in the dollar and of the original investment. So again, if you, if you put in $200,000 at the start, a few years later, you thought you had half a million dollars. You, mm. you, you're getting twenty percent of your original investment. So for so for most people, it, it seemed like a, you know, a, just a tiny, tiny fraction of, of of what they put in, and and so so much later. Would you be surprised to hear someone who said that a lot of her parents' friends sold their farms and invested all the money into Ross assets? I, I think there there were stories that a lot of farmers from Manawatu and Wairarapa. That, that did do exactly that. And, you know, if your friend had done that and was getting a good experience, getting good returns, then you were encouraged to do that. I mean, even I like, if I'm getting an electrician, I liked to know that one of my friends has had, you know, had the service from that person. So it is a, it is a real reminder that you, you know, you shouldn't just trust, trust what your friends tell you because I think, you know, your friends were in the scheme. You, you thought that it must be legitimate. Yeah. Has the law changed at all to protect investors from these sorts of schemes? N not really. There was a um, the, the the financial markets authority has tightened up some of the rules around financial advisors, around the disclosures that they have to make, around the rules, the the hurdles they have to jump through. The law around Ponzi schemes hasn't changed. There was a, a proposal. To, there, there've been some very minor changes, but in the way that um, that would affect unwinding a Ponzi scheme, it hasn't. It was proposed to, and um, Chris Farfoy shelved it. Um, this is a fairly small. These these frauds are happening all the time. There aren't aren't that many of them. I would say that in the US they have quite a different philosophy. The the Bernie Madoff fraud that was uncovered in two thousand and eight, and I believe is the largest of its type ever. They're still clawing back money now, twelve years later, and 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 their philosophy is, in simple terms, to just claw back every cent. So if you even got your original sum of money out, mm -hmm. they, they, they claw it all back and then wait to wait to return the money later. Whereas in New Zealand, there's a, you know, it, it, they can only reverse transactions that were two years before a company's collapse and the, the courts found that people could keep their original capital. So that, that was part of the reason why investors only got a, such a small, the, those who lost only got such a small proportion of their money back. Well, thanks for listening to Crimes NZ, hosted by me, Jesse Mulligan. You can catch more of me each afternoon from 1 to 4 on RNZ National. We've got an upbeat mix of mostly New Zealand stories, including some you can catch as a podcast, like Our Changing World, our science series, or Voices, which tells the personal stories of people from all over the world who now call Aotearoa home. You can find all RNZ's podcasts on the website, rnz.co.nz, and they're on Apple, Spotify, iHeart, or wherever you catch your favourite podcasts.